over the last 15 years, we've been talking about demographics, but now, obviously, the sort of chickens are coming home to roost. Um, India is adding a million people a month to their population. We're adding over 60 million people a year, um, closer probably to even 80 million, which is closer to the German population in the world population. I'm with the global economist and uh, best-selling author, Dambisa Moyo. Uh, she is uh, on many boards, uh, Chevron right now, Barclays Bank uh, has been uh, on Time 100 Most Influential Leaders in the World list and uh, delighted uh, to have her here with me today. Thank you. Happy to be here. So, so Dambisa, so much to talk about, but I mean, yeah. a, a, as you know, I think about where we are in the global economy right now, and you have been decidedly more negative than most. <laughs> so l let me let me start by asking you that. What, first of all, what, how how concerned are you? Uh, I mean, I, I thought that things were starting to get better, um, and and why. So um, it's absolutely the case that things tactically, so in the short term, things have improved. It's, you know, we've seen median incomes in the United States improve. We have seen the stock market reach record highs. We've seen the VIX, which is a measure of volatility, at record lows. So there is the sense that um, we're moving in the right direction. And of course, there's a whole suite of policies that have been promised that actually also buttress this sort of positive mood, from tax reform, infrastructure spending, and also this idea that there'll be a large repatriation of capital in into the, US, the United States. States, yes. of course. Um, and if you look more generally around the world, there is definitely buoyancy. I mean, the IMF has just revised their forecast for 2017 and 18. Um, we will certainly be seeing a three-handled uh, GDP number, but I think the expectations by many people are that we'll see even higher numbers um, when you add the factor in the, the global economy. Um, why so am I? Over 4% oh, global growth. Oh, certainly. I think you can get a 4% 4, 4 print before we start to worry about. In 2018. Uh, I would say end of 2018, yes, I'd be quite optimistic that you could get that. But a lot of so, things so have far, to happen. I'm feeling pretty good yeah. from what you're talking However, about. that's yeah. very short term. It's very tactical. And of course, on the back of, on, you know, on historically never before seen uh, loose monetary policy, we've got very low interest rates. We continue to have this quantitative easing, of which, of course, is being withdrawn. But it's still um, a very, uh, a very unique circumstances that have created these, uh, these uh, very buoyant uh, economic conditions. Um, the reason I remain deeply concerned is that there are a whole host of structural factors that we all know and are aware of, but we are not being addressed. Things like technology and the jobless underclass, demographic shifts that are adding you know, hundreds of millions of people in terms of expectations in the next several uh, decades, um, natural resource scarcity, income inequality. I mean, the implications of income inequality um, for, polit for politics and for political dynamics continue to be quite worrisome. What about the debt burden? You know, virtually every single class of debt, sovereign debt, household debt, auto loan debt, student debt is now at record highs. So there are some big structural so, factors that are not being addressed. So those, those are a lot of things. Yes. Uh, I mean, there's always things, of course, that aren't being addressed in the global economy, but it's a long list. Yes. Um, <laughs> let, maybe before I ask you about them individually, let me say, what, what kind of urgency do you think there is? I mean, because some of these things, when you talk about demographics, when you talk about, you know, sort of automation, uh, they're longer term. Yeah. I mean, you know, is this an environment where we could easily have a run up of five, 10 years that feel pretty good before you start really getting squeezed? People thought Europe was a disaster for decades, but you know, it had a pretty good run yes. while it did. Is that, is that the kind of thing you're no, talking I'm about No, I'm more concerned, and I, I'm largely concerned because there's been a convergence from, over the last 15 years, we've been talking about demographics, but now, obviously, the sort of chickens are coming home to roost. Um, India is adding a million people a month to their population. We're adding over 60 million people a year, um, closer probably to even 80 million, which is closer to the German population in the world population. I mean, the forecasts coming out um, for the global population are not so far term that we shouldn't be concerned. What's, what's the what's the most urgent? I mean, what's the so, thing that I mean that could approximately <laughs> under the next 
one or two years yeah. that you think could add, that people aren't paying attention to that mm -hmm. you say this is a headline well, I, that would worry. So I think that the the, the question that um, maybe if I could restructure your question slightly is why is this time different? Right. You know, a lot of these aspects of things. Why is it yeah. problematic? Yeah. And it's for me, from a perspective of being an economist, it's particularly problematic because policies become impotent. So the idea that you can inflate the economy by either massive government spending or you could have this situation where you have low interest rates may be good in the short term, but longer term it is not to strategy. Well, what's the first, again, go back to, what's the first that you think could actually hit? So I think the trigger will be a, a rate path um, that's expected next year. So higher interest Increased rates, which will impact a, the enormous the debt in the United States, but mm -hmm. many other countries are also expected. As you mm -hmm. know, the United Kingdom, um, was, they're already, um, Bank of England's already planning and has yep. been um, sort of uh, sensitizing the markets for mm -hmm. a rate hike there. So I think absolutely the implications of not just the rate, a path of rate hikes, but also the withdrawal of quantitative easing, which has been uh, supported this uh, this great environment. Mm -hmm. I think those things could be trigger factors. Um, but beyond that, there's a whole host of other factors that sort of dominoes that start to fall um, once you have slower growth. I mean, the political implications you're very aware of in a situation where income inequality is widening, but also so um, your growth scenario slows down. is end of 2018, we could have four percent global growth. 2019, 2020, suddenly it looks dramatically worse. As but a all, those forecasts are heavily hinged on what happens in the United States with public policy. So, um, we, you know, I can sit here and give you the most optimistic scenario and say, yes, it could be a 4% print next year. But that really re relies on, um, we, you know, getting some reasonable tax reform. I mean, there already is speculation that it might be much more of a drip feed as opposed to a massive uh, overhaul in terms of taxation. So those types of implications have really deep uh, impact impact in terms of what capital allocation decisions and investment decisions um, corporations are, are making. And, I, and you know, I'm sure, that the dividend to retained earning ratio for many of the big corporations, so this is the amount of money that companies are paying back um, as dividends, is now over 100%. To me, that is very emblematic of a concern by CEOs um, that they are worried about this, the reinvestment prospects and, and generating capital. Now, that, that implies that if you bring back an awful lot of money, you repatriate it, that why are the companies going to do anything different with it than they do right well, now? I, I is think that you your will. Question? I think you will need a policy diktat. I mean, in the past we have seen a situation where money was allowed to flow back into the United States in the 1980s, um, but a lot of that money was simply used to repay uh, shareholders in terms of dividends. Um, I think in this environment, I mean, there are ways for government to say, well, we're happy for you to bring back your money and 10% tax rate, but you have to spend X percent of it on retooling or in infrastructure investment or, you know, some take So pick. if it's simply a repatriation with them paying it's not taxes, enough. that would not be an effective policy It's in not view. enough. I think it, given where the, the global growth and specifically the growth in the United States, the prospects for growth in the United States and the challenges that I've mentioned, the low participation rates in labor, et cetera, um, we, we need more aggressive public policy, it would seem, than just sort of very superficial uh, um, sort of uh, plans. Now, do you, do you think that um, a significant reduction in the corporate tax rate is the right policy, should be a priority with growth being what it is right now in the U.S. and the markets being what they are? I think it may certainly mask in the short term what I consider to be more structural long-term problems. So, for example, if you're the CEO of Take Your Company, X, Y, or Z, um, you could see a vast amount of money coming back into the, com the, into the company, but you have to still make a pitch to the board and to your, your fellow colleagues um, that there are reasonable growth prospe um, prospects whether in the United States or globally, that could actually generate a significant return um, to the, cap the cost of capital. Uh, I think a lot of CEOs are worried because the policy environment isn't so incredibly volatile. I mean, it's not obvious what um, happens to, in terms of uh, globalization. There's still a lot of ambiguity in into whether companies are going to have to be more siloed. So this idea of being able to, uh, what they call the carry trade, borrow money cheaply in the U.S., invest in Brazil, um, Japan, those types yeah. of, yeah, those types of trades um, are under threat. And so so it's not simply money just coming back. I mean, the, the, it's much more about the need to see fundamental structural change to the, the, the global policy environment that we have right now. Now, when you sit on a lot of boards and they're having these conversations, um, is, is, from their perspective, is it just a give us this money right now? Like we're happy because we're we're the ones that see the gain or are they equally worried that this isn't sustainable? How short-termist oh. 
do you feel these boards and oh, these leaderships are Oh, I think the right short-termism has absolutely seeped into the psychology of not just the corporations, but also of investors. Mm -hmm. So investors not only want to see dividends coming back to them in the form of capital uh, gains or even share buybacks, but they also are deeply concerned about the long-term uh, um, sort of longevity of these corporations. I mean, just look at the data. Um, in the past 10 years, half uh, we've gone to half of the stock uh, number of companies that are trading on the stock markets. People don't have a lot of faith or they're deeply concerned about what the prospects for companies that have quarterly earnings are. Um, we've also seen the number, the tenure of CEOs decline quite dramatically. In the 1970s, a CEO hung around for about 10 years. Yes, and that's much, in, it's now it's yeah. much, it's much shorter, yeah. not just for the CEOs, but mm -hmm. for CFOs as well. That, to me, is very reflective of this um, sort of culture or concern around, uh, around long-term investing, but also in terms of viability of these companies. Is capitalism working? From an American or from a global perspective, in your view? Well, I think it's absolutely clear it needs to be reformed somewhat. I mean, I myself am a red-blooded capitalist. I mean, I do believe in investing and innovation and really trying to encourage the differentiation um, of, of expertise. That, and I think that that really is a, is a backbone of capitalism. But it's fair to say that we do have reasonable concerns around the short-termism that has come in and seeped into the psychology. But also, you know, we can't overlook things like income inequality, which is so deeply entrenched. You cannot have viable businesses um, in a place where people are feeling that they're unable to participate, um, not only today, but their prospects for social mobility and improvement of their livelihoods is, is not good. I mean, that is just not a viable strategy for a capitalist, um, a capitalist ethos. So let's go back now to your list of yes. concerns and woes for the global economy, hit you on each of them and see how you respond. So the first, you said demographics, yes. right? And you talked about the explosion globally, the explosion in India. Now, I remember that book, The Population Bomb. Yes. I think it was in the 70s. Gosh, maybe even soon earlier than that, and, yes. And, and of course, it was massively alarmist and it was massively overstated. And, and not only did people, as they got sort of you know wealthier stopped having the kids urbanization women and so forth but also technology allowed us to create a lot more food for a lot mm -hmm. more cheaply what well, why is this time different well you know first of all i wouldn't i wouldn't dismiss the forecasts of that period and i'm not sort of a naysayer about what has happened um, but let's if you take a a more clear lensed view about what has happened over the last 30 40 years so let's take from the 1970s um, we have delivered economic growth but it's quite precarious economic growth because we've been able to finance it through debt mm -hmm. massive amount of debt and you know the notion that uh, everybody's better off i think is is not entirely correct because a lot of people are struggling, their livelihoods have been materially uh, uh, you know, uh, deteriorated over the past 30 to 40 years. Their prospects in terms of social mobility, in terms of the prospects of their children um, have been materially impacted. And so I think it's a bit simplistic to just say, oh, it's, you know, it's all been you know, wonderful and they, they were wrong. Um, you know, in terms of where we are today, uh, the UN forecasts that by 20, I think it's 2075, 40% of the world's population will be from Africa. From Africa. I mean, that is mm -hmm. an enormous and right shift. now it's what, 15 It's about 15%, yeah. yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, that if you just think about that statistic, I mean, you know, how many companies do, do we, you and I interact with which which don't have that on their radar? It's not that Most. far away, That's right. you know? And, and if we don't even just take, I'm picking on Africa right now, but if you, we don't t actually take that seriously, we could have a population, you know, implications in terms of um, disorderly immigration. There are lots of knock-on effects that could emerge if we don't have a very strategic, um, and powerful solution to creating economic growth globally. But, but isn't the question of African demographic growth rates massively uncertain on the basis of how much growth, how much famine, and all the rest? I mean, I remember mm -hmm. Hans Rosling, yes. the great the Swedish late, yes. before he died. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, he had these incredible graphs showing, you know, just hockey stick of African growth, mm -hmm. but then also said, we really don't know very much mm -hmm. about where this is going to go. Do, do you feel like that's become clearer? Yeah, look, so uh, all the, I mean, the, the beauty with geopolitical uh, discussions as well as economic discussions is that we don't know with certainty, but the problem or the 
challenge of public policy and also business to a large extent is to devise strategies that um, work with within some reason or some range. So you know, it, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, is it absolutely to the point going to be forty percent of the world's population? We have no idea. But are there deep concerns given where the rates of growth are in terms of the population, not just in Africa, but I mentioned India earlier? Of course, and I think it would be um, foolhardy of any policymaker to assume that they're not that that's not possible. Um, if 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 nothing else, um, a lot of the, the statistics that we're looking at, not just in population, but a whole range of other things, have actually shown have shown up later, but they've shown up to the downside, uh, to bigger risk than we had expected. Um, and I think the financial crisis is a good example, not demographics, but how, you know, they, when bad things show up, they do show up later. Um, but when they do show up, they are, they're, they're later and they're much bigger than expected, as Dorn Bush had said. But to the extent that we're concerned about demographics going forward, mm -hmm. it's, in your view, it's overwhelmingly the African concern long term. I think the think skew is um, absolutely in, in Africa, but it's also in places like India. Um, I think that the, they, they, have all, they have in the past adopted quite aggressive policies to, to manage their, their population growth much earlier than China with their one-child policy. But I think it, this is absolutely one of the key uh, drivers of the, uh, of the for the projections for, for global prospects in the last, next, next century. Now, a second piece of that, which you also mentioned before, was the issue of where do the jobs come from, yes. given automation, AI, yes. and all the rest. Now, uh, Jeff Bezos, yes. a few weeks ago, uh, told me that he believed that AI was going to create even more jobs than we have now, mm -hmm. um, and that this is nothing new. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you see it differently. Well, it, it may very well be the case, but once again, from the lens of public policy, we cannot uh, form public policy or opine on future growth based on things that are not entirely clear to us today. Um, so in 1900, 60% of the American population was involved in agriculture. Today, it's less than 3%, but mm -hmm. some, some more aggressive estimates is less than 2%. Um, you know, that has been a transition over 100 years through manufacturing and through uh, serve, into the service services. sector. Today, over 80%, as you know, the 80% of American workers are involved in the service sector. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think to sit here and say, oh, we should, really shouldn't worry about uh, about automation and, and AI because it will create jobs is not a strategy for potentially what could happen. If we have the service sector uh, transition into anywhere close to where manufacturing is today, around 18% of the of the workforce, or some less than 3% in agriculture, we do have a question to answer about what it is we're going to do with a lot of people who are not not just the unskilled workers, also skilled workers. And, and it's I happening think a lot faster. It's absolutely, so. and it's and it's. Not, you know, I'm not going to stick my neck out and say it's absolutely not the case that AI will create jobs, but I think it, it, it is a, there's a bit of nuance that's required here in terms of that job creation. And, and, and where are the policy solutions in all of this? I mean, do, do you see anyone out there with real power um, that gives you hope that we're starting to address the issues? So that's a, a brilliant question, and I think that there's sort of two answers to it. On the one hand, as I intimated earlier, it is absolutely the case that public policy has become quite impotent. The tools that we traditionally use, particularly in economics, but also in geopolitical engagement, are no longer valid. So in economics, both fiscal and monetary policy have become more challenged. From the perspective of geopolitical engagement, as you will know better than I am sure, is you know the, uh, the, 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 the sort of emergence of non-state actors, and I'm not talking about ISIS only, I'm talking about wealthy philanthropists who are underwriting public goods, that whole change in the dynamic means that we have a, these tools that we relied on in the 20th century need not apply as, as, as effectively as they have in the past. So that's one issue. The other issue really pertains to the fact that um, our the, that governments have tried the the toolkit that we have used in the past. Meaning we've had left-leaning policies, so tax and redistribution, and frankly, they have failed to deliver in terms of long-term mm -hmm. sustainability. Think about income inequality as an example. But we've also tried the more right-wing approach, um, which is much more about uh, um, supply, supply side, side, low taxes. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that has also not also worked. Not worked yeah. And so we're in this world now where um, public policy makers are really driven, I think, by um, nefarious is probably too too unfair, but they're driven by the short-term uh, need and desire to be re-elected. And the implications of that in a world where the toolkit is, two is ineffective is much more so dramatic. So if the corporations are driven by the short-term yes. and the politicians are driven by the short-term, I mean, don't tell me you're just holding your hope out for the Pope. I mean, where, <laughs> who, who's, who's doing long-term? 
Well, we do have um, sovereign wealth funds, you know, pensions ostensibly should be thinking about the long term. And I do think that there is scope in that regard. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a big uh, bureaucrat. I don't really love lots of government interference and involvement. But I do think in these types of environments, um, government does have an important role to play. So, for example, just to give you a very specific uh, policy initiative, if governments in the United States said, you know what, um, pension funds, this is our money as the average citizen we're putting money into these pension funds, we should care about infrastructure, for example. And so we're going to insist that X percentage of the pension money goes to support infrastructure. I can't imagine that uh, the average citizen will find that uh, um, hard to, to swallow. Of course, there'll be people who say, well, I don't want the government interfering. But I do think there has to be some kind of a match of assets and liabilities that works for, for society. So, and, I, and I'm quite optimistic that, that that mood is coming. And one other thing you raised was resource scarcity. Not yes. something I hear about much, given that commodity prices have been comparatively yes. depressed recently. Yes. You see that turning around. Yes, again, this is really structural. And you know, I think that the uh, the sort of skeptic or naysayer may say, well, come on, for God's sake, we in the 1700s, you had Thomas Malthus talking about, uh, uh, about natural resource scarcity. We've had the Club of Rome in the 1970s talking about natural resource scarcity. Why is it now that this should be different? Right. Um, but it's really because of the population boom. Um, you know, if you read the literature, the scale and the speed of the population growth that we're witnessing right now has never happened before in history or prehistory. And the forecasters, the demographic dem uh, demographers, um, estimate that it will never happen again once the world's population plateaus out in 2100. So we are in this very unique period of time. And it's absolutely the case that potable water, arable land, minerals, and energy are scarce, finite, and depleting. Now, in the previous two issues you talked about, yes. short-termism and a lack of policy response yeah. was a real problem. Yes. Now, here, you could at least argue that the efforts to create technological responses for inexpensive food, mm -hmm. for inexpensive, for for cleaner water, for solar power, all these things. But that that's happening kind of full steam ahead, wouldn't well, you say? Well, I that? wouldn't say full steam ahead. I think there are certainly efforts. I mean, I think my concern is that the leaders of things like desalination are largely emerging market countries. So you know, take China, China. take Saudi Arabia, yep. um, and this is not to say it's a bad thing. I mean, I live in a world. I you know, well, I'm hopeful. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope right. for a yeah. world where where you know, innovation and transformation come from anywhere on the planet, but it would seem to me that you want the countries that have a legacy of, of great history of delivering on R&D to be at the forefront of, of, uh, of developing a lot of the innovation in healthcare and education in, um, in you know, natural resources. And I, I worry quite a bit that we, we don't see a lot of the big Western countries, the United States and, and other countries really at the forefront of some of these innovations. And, and why do you think that is, given that so much of the new technology developments are happening through the entrepreneurship of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and biotech around Boston, Pittsburgh, Chicago, yes. you name it. Why, why, why do you think that these issues aren't being addressed? So in the I think I wouldn't say they are not being addressed. I think it's a question on, on rank order. You know, wh why are they not a priority? And I think that a large reason for that is that the, um, the in these other countries, the government is a leader. And we've seen this in the United States before. The United States has a history through DARPA and through past innovations of being a leader, in building out infrastructure. But for whatever reason, and I think a lot of it has to do with short-termism that's crept into public policy and politics in the United States. It's gotten more aggressive. Um, I think that the U.S. government is taking a much more of a back seat in supporting a lot of these innovations. And whether it's a nuclear or some of the other areas that you mentioned already, I think that there's much more scope for government there. So Dembi Samoyo, a heroine of the Tennessee Valley Authority in the United States, will promote that. But wonderful <laughs> being with it's you today. It's a pleasure today. being here. Thank you. Sure, we'll do it again. Thank you.